All right, so um, I'll, um, I'll try to speak through this, uh, and uh, I have a hopeful, helpful uh, time left person, right, who will tell me if I am overrunning this. Um, okay, so this is the Trinitarian pedagogy, and this is a piece of a larger project, of course. Irina mentioned that has to do with the pedagogy of relation or relational pedagogy. Uh, actually, that little piece didn't make it into the book because it didn't quite fit. So, and what I'm going to do is, uh, uh, there is a Greek theologian, uh, John Zizoulos, uh, and he had, a, he had this interesting essay on kind of relational ontology, and I think that's kind of my starting point. Um, and what I'm trying to say is a very simple thought, uh, it's a very simple idea that we live through the time where aims of education, uh, all education, not just public education, are shifting from one to something else. And, um, and that's, what I, what, that's, that, that's the thought I'm trying to ad advance today. And I have to make a comment on my method here, because as I need to explain to you that although I'm using some of the religious texts here, I'm not a theologian. So to describe my method, imagine a barbarian that would enter an antique tool shop. You know, all these beautiful instruments, very, very wonderful. The barbarian has no idea what they're intended to do. But the barbarian thinks, oh, I can use this one to hammer nails. It might be a microscope, but that's the barbarian's idea of using it. Uh, or I can use this to fix my door or something like that. Um, so in other words, if I put it in more serious terms, it's, it's, uh, I'm an applied philosopher. And applied is really the major term here. We apply things. Uh, and we find them where we can. Um, and then we use. Uh, uh, we use them for our purposes. Um, and I want to add, without, without regard for authenticity of how we use that. That's, that would be an important uh, clarification. Also, we don't do it only to, to theology. Uh, we also do it to a number of other academic disciplines. We come as, bar as barbarians to sociology, to anthropology, wherever we can find stuff that might, that might be useful to us. Um, so don't ask me any hard questions about theology, OK? That's the, that's the deal. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start with a very generic question. Why, why is there a trinity? You know, if you're, if you're not from a Christian background, you might wonder, why is it there in the first place? Uh, it doesn't have any kind of, uh, it doesn't appear in the Bible. It's a secret. It, it was kind of created much later. Uh, and it's. Um, for many, especially from outside of Christianity, it felt like a step back from monotheism to more polytheistic religions, kind of a compromise. Uh, and it seems to be invented to justify some claims that Jesus made directly about his own divinity. Um, and there was also, um, I think, the, there was also a very powerful heresy within Christianity, Arianism that kind of claimed that, you know, try to return some normalcy to that, that whole Christianity saying, wait, 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 wait a minute, he was just a prophet or maybe he was son of God, but not exactly the, of divine or the same nature with, with the God the Father. Um, and then Arianism was very, very, very powerful, but then in the end, all, almost all, well, maybe some of the exceptions, uh, Christian traditions right now are Trinitarian. So why did why did the, the idea of Trinity won? And I think the the answer is simple: is that you know, uh, I mean, people need God to kind of think about ideals, um, and that's why all all cultures have some sort of an idea of a God. But it's really, I mean, if you translate it in the contemporary language, it's what should be, right? Or what, what's the good thing? Or, or um, so, and I think the, this, the, the Trinity allowed to kind of reinvent the God, you know, if the, the Old Testament Jewish God was more of a God of action, and he did a lot, and he is a creator or actor, he, will, he was doing something to, to the world. Now, this whole, the, the Trinity came as the idea of, yes, he is an actor and a creator, but also he is a model of like perfect relationship. So when you take the, the Trinity, it is the model of, of the perfect relationship. And of course, um, uh, you know, Christians discovered that your ideals cannot be too specific. 
the too concrete. Otherwise, you kind of disintegrate and you become an, an idolater, right? So there was a huge debate between uh, iconophiles, uh, iconoclasts, and idolaters. Like how, how concrete your ideal should be. Like if you ask why there is a prohibition against uh, statues of God or like graven images, as they say. Well, it's too specific, you know, it's too concrete. And then there were iconoclasts who didn't want any, any images at all, no symbols, no nothing. And of course, there was a compromise uh, with the iconophiles. You know, think of the, the, the idea of Trinity as sort of this fuzzy picture of the perfect relation is. It's balanced, it's reciprocal, it has a history to it, and it's not relation to oneself. There are three, three persons, they have the same essence, but they're, they're three persons in relation with each other. Uh, there was also relation with humanity that God had, but that was humanity's kind of thought as, eh, not so perfect. You know, humanity is, is thought as, as very flawed um, kind of species that you have to deal with. You can love them, but it's never going to be a reciprocal kind of a totally balanced relation. Yeah, I hope I'm not speaking too fast for, for the interpreters. I've been to one of those cabins. I know how hard this work is. Um, so basically, I think that the claim of Trinity was that, yes, action and creation is important, but relations uh, or relation is a separate and equally valued domain or aspect of human life. Uh, and I have to say that, that that idea was brought up many times, and most maybe recent, uh, it was Martin Buber and Mikhail Bakhtin, who are actually more connected than we think. They kind of uh, developed this theory of dialogue. I have a number of problems with that theory. I mean, I, I really recognize their breakthrough because they, they kind of resurrected this idea of relational ontology in a contemporary secular language, actually. So dialogue is a very secular idea of that kind of perfect relationship. Unfortunately, what they created was more or less exclusionary, too narrowly defined. Um, ideal for humanity, so they kind of shifted towards more idolatry, I think, in, in their thinking. But, you know, I greatly respect both of these uh, guys, and I don't wish to offend anyone who are fans of uh, Bakhtin or, or Buber. Um, <clears throat> and and uh, another thing is that uh, the church early on rec recognized that they kind of, you know, they had these great ideas, but they also kind of need to build an institution for the society which turned out to be a very difficult task. <clears throat> so they actually really needed this idea of, there's a personal salvation, of course. You can't get away with that. You actually have to have an idea of collective salvation as well. So it's not only that you have to be you know, saved and, and become better, but people around you too, they have to become better. They have to, they have, to have a, a like gradually improving communities rather than just any community at all. <clears throat> so, in uh, Western philosophy, there is a thing that I may call antique bias. I don't know if it uh, comes from the word entity. So, the entities, it comes from Aristotle, actually. In Aristotle, like, things are important, are primary, relations are secondary. Uh, and I think it kind of, uh, the, the Christian theology, especially early patristic philosophy, was challenging that but it came back to the Western philosophy. We still think that things and people are primary and how they enter in relation with each other is the secondary reality that we need to study. I don't agree with that. I think relations as real, as important, and maybe more important than entities or beings or, or things. Um, so I think the, you know, the, the, the idea of Trinity came a little early in the human development maybe 2,000 years too early, so we really may be now starting to understand why it was, it was so important. Um, and it has to do with economic shifts. Uh, I'm not, uh, it's, um, I have a more complex argument, I'm not going to dwell on it, but basically it has to do with uh, um, the human society was organized a lot about action and labor and doing something, changing the nature, changing the world, changing things. Uh, we're getting to the point where maybe we've changed enough uh, and we need to think about our relations rather than action more. 
Um, now, what does it have to do with education? I'm an educational philosopher. Like I said, I use all these bits and pieces to help us to think through education. So there is a, you know, I, you know, in, in my in my book, I, I had a, this kind of thought experiment. So what if we, what if we enter um, largely society without employment, which could happen within the next 30 years or so, where m most people won't be working anymore. So how do we explain kids? Why do you come to school? I mean, we've been telling them, oh, you come to school, you know, you get a good job, career, and then you'll be happy. Well, what if there are no jobs? So what are you going to tell them? Or maybe, let's say, less than half, fewer than half of all people are working and the rest of them are not. That's uh, uh, Keynes, the great uh, economic theorist in the 1930s, actually thought about it. And he said, well, in about, 30 year, uh, about 100 years, we'll get there. His paper was 1930s, so we're getting there where you know, employment is optional. And with that, the whole kind of a castle that we built around explaining why you need to learn to work is crumbling in front of our eyes. Maybe the young kids who are here in, this, in, your, in your seats in the morning will have, face that dilemma. What do you, what, why do you live? Why do you come to school? Um, so, and education is looking actually in many, many different ways for uh, new reasons to exist because we can't, we can't dismantle it. The institution is too precious, too important for society to dismantle it. But you need to have a different foundation for it. Um, and I want to say that there is nothing new about recognizing the importance of relations in education. It's been done before. Um, but few, few people realize that there's, it's not just important, it's the essence of education. You kind of create this relationality and that's why you're doing it. Learning algebra is a tool to do that. So I call it the swap of instrumentality, right? So we, many of us think that, oh, relationships are good, but your test scores are more important or your you know, academic achievement or learning outcomes. Uh, so relations was thought to be relationship was thought to be instrumental instrumental in relation in with respect to learning goals. The school's here to learn, the relationships are supporting the whole structure. And I think what's happening is actually what should happen is the other the other flip around. Uh, in other words, try to think about it. I mean I know it's hard, but try to think about that that uh, quadratic equations are there to build relationship with and among students. That's a difficult shift to make, but it's an excuse, right? So when you, when you come together with your friends, to, I don't know, to play cards, you're not there to play cards, right? You are there to actually hang, you know, hang with them, learn more about them, relate to them, have relationships built and developed. Cards are an excuse. So it's kind of the same shift. Um, and I have to say that there are actually very clear historic precedents, like the institution of family, historically was an economic arrangement, and sometimes very unequal, very uh, dominating. Uh, a romantic love was a uh, means to the end. And now it's not, you know, people actually enter into some sort of partnership or marriage for the purpose of maintaining relationships. Other things became instrumental to it. Some people believe that that's what ruined the institution of family. They really have no idea what they're talking about. They created the completely new institution of family based on relation, based on love. Of course, it is a little less stable than the one, one uh, based on force or, or brute kind of force of law. But it is a better institution. So I think something like that is going to, to happen to schools as well. Uh, and of course, there is a question, how do we get there? So, um, you know, we, with this an interesting period of time, if you walk into any educational ministry in, in this continent, you will see people that are kind of lost. They don't know what to do next. You know, everybody was trying to, to build this um, accountability reform, the first standards movement, and then we try to measure them, the testing movement, and then accountability. It's in different countries, slightly different, but it's like everybody was hoping that we can actually, you know, improve education by um, 
by holding educators accountable, you know, so we know how well you teach, so let's, let's hold you to it. Um, the problem with this whole approach is that it failed. We can't really show much for it. You know, we can't. Uh, nobody can show that it was, uh, it was effective. Even if you measure very narrowly defined sort of the testing uh, outcomes, you know, you all remember that Finland was at some point the darling of the world. Everybody went to Finland to see what is it they do with their education. It's so wonderful. And then uh, in, I think it was 2018, Finland dropped like a rock toward the bottom. We're talking like one and a half standard deviation drop. So if you ask Finns what happened, they'll tell you, we don't know. Now, of course, Estonia is the darling of the world, right? Everybody's coming. What is it Estonians do with their education? It's so wonderful. Well, don't, don't you know, kid yourself. You know, a few years down the road, you'll drop as well, and you will have no idea why. Um, and I mean, it's nice when people are coming, they're spending their money here. But um, yeah, so we, don't, uh, we, don't, we can't really show um, there is OECD, Operation for Economic Cooperation and Development, which I used to be a representative of Russian Federation. They were looking for those things. So there was a great hope for accountability. They can't find a trace of its effectiveness, actually. There was a great hope for technology. No one can find any trace of improving learning outcomes by introducing educational technology. And this is not coming from me. Um, Peter Schleicher, who is like the father of PISA, he admitted that. I mean, he doesn't want to say it publicly a lot, but he said it quite publicly. Like, look, we looked. There is no data there. And then there was a third reform, which had to do with choice, school choice. Like, if you do, you know, uh, kind of let parents choose, then the market forces will kind of improve the schools, and the choice somehow lifts all the boats. Uh, well, it didn't happen either. I'm sorry to disappoint you. There were some improvements that you can trace, but they're minimal. And some countries went full scale, like Chile. Chile had this huge voucher program nationwide. Middle class kids benefited a little. Lower class kids suffered. If you measure overall across the country, nah, not that much difference. So anyway, uh, there is again, uh, there is this very kind of tense silence in educational ministries. They have no idea what to do next, right? You can't run the same reform all the time with showing that they actually had some, some uh, benefit. So that's why there, there, is a, uh, there, there is this uh, shift, people are looking for it. There is a number of different approaches. One of them is social and, economic, social and emotional learning. Uh, there's a well-being movement and, and, and there's pedagogy of relation. They're all trying to address that problem. It's like, what do we do next? So, and how do we get if we, uh, I think uh, um, focus on relation is more practical because well-being is a result, right? Or social economic learning is a result. Uh, relational pedagogy focuses on the process. How do you get there? You build certain kind of relations with, with, with students and among them. And how do we get there is, uh, I think it's important to recognize the intrinsic value of relation in education. Just say it, you know, and talk about that. And I know that uh, this wonderful school that hosts us does it already. That's why I came. I want everybody to do the same. Um, there is an intentional discourse. Uh, we talk, teachers, if you listen to them, talk a lot about learning in their conferences. When they go to teacher's lounge, they talk a lot about relations. So I want that to be reversed, you know. You need to actually professionally, specifically, systematically talking about relations in schools. Uh, we need to train teachers differently because um, in most countries, we, nobody specifically tells you. So when you walk into the classroom, how do you actually build relationships with your students? Um, you may get some of it in the educational psychology course. In the US, there are courses on classroom management, believe it or not you may actually get something from there, but nobody systematically explains. Like, the first thing you need to do, actually, you need to get them to like you, you need to get into enter some sort of relationship with them, and then they will learn, maybe, maybe. But that's, that's still a shorter uh, way. Um, you can just walk in and say, quadratic equations today, and they look at you like, why? Right? Um, so there is also, there is also very, very little understood uh, connection between the peer relationship, like within the classroom, among students, and the one with the teacher. 
And a lot of teachers think that I walk in and I, you know, I'm in immediately should be the king uh, and the center of attention here. No, 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 that's not how relationship works. In many cases, kids' relationship precede you. You have to fit in, you have to find your place, you have to kind of respect and understand their internal structure. And of course, the last thing that we need, not the last, but uh, if we need to actually learn to measure relationships. And I know a lot of people will eat me alive when I, whenever I say that. And I'm, I'm sticking to it. I think um, educational, education consumes between 6 to 8 percent of GDP. There's a huge money involved. So the public will never tell us, take the money, do whatever you wish with it. We'll never ask any questions. So if you think that's going to happen in education, think again. They are going to, sh to ask us to show some proof. And the only way to show proof if you actually learn to kind of understand what sort of relationships you have, how do you measure them? Relationship in the school better than in this one. Can you prove it beyond anecdotal evidence? If you can't do it, then none of it will become reality. Unfortunately, that's the world we live in. Um, so, and yeah, and the workshop will be like one of the f attempts to build kind of a scale measuring uh, relationships in a class and also school wide, but it comes later. How are we doing on time? Does anyone? Doing well. Okay. Ah, all right. Yeah, and um, I'm actually, um, uh, no, let me give you one example here. So it's uh, like one of the way to understand what a school or university uh, values. So look at their mission, mission statements, or sometimes value statements. And you will see, and nobody reads them except for me, I think, uh, and they're usually terribly boring. Um, but you can still, there's a difference. Like, for example, my university that I work with, uh, what, are, what is their uh, values? So they, they, mis they list student success, scholarship, research, and creative activity, diversity and inclusion community engagement, innovation, integrity, and accountability, right? Uh, none of these things are relational values, right? Out of whatever 12 words, not one, not one is about human relationships. And I'll give you uh, another example from a writer university. It's, uh, you, you've never heard of it. It's a, it's a private university in, in New Jersey somewhere, right? So here's their values. No person roams these halls as a stranger. Uh, and integrity of word and deeds forms the foundation of all relationships. Right? So they clearly state what they're all about. You know, they're about this relational experience that students are about to get. I'm not sure, I've never been there. I don't know if they do it well or they're just claiming to do that. But they're smart enough to recognize, oh, that's important. Um, and it's an interesting, maybe, um, anecdote. You know, some 12 years or so, there was this guy called uh, Clay Christensen. He died since then. He, he predicted that in 10 years, there will be only three or four universities left in the world because you can learn online anything you want. All right? So, uh, okay, 10 years later, no, we don't have four or five universities in the world because students come on campus and school as well not to learn anything they come to have that experience of being it's sort of a it's the it's the period of your time that you need to have it's part of our human story yes i went to school and i had all these friends this experience these memories and I, I i built some relational space around me the same with universities that's not what they come they come stay in the door uh, in a dormitory where your neighbor is likely to be your best man at your wedding right that's why you come you you find you come to find a partner for life you come to experience something uh, to expand your your repertoire of relationality that's why you come so and i just want to also cite the mission of uh, of this school st john's and they're saying this, pedagogy is primarily a relationship in life. The school is consciously committed to creating and maintaining good relationships between children, children and teachers, colleagues, families, and school, parents, and children. 
So, I mean, you can do it. You just need to have a little bit of imagination how to, how to do this. Um, and of course, I, I want to say that we don't know much about relationality yet. Um, we have these great ideas, grandiose ideas, but one of the, one of the things that uh, we don't know exactly is the specifics of educational relation as opposed to any other one. It's not a family. I mean, a family could be kind of a, a metaphor, but it's really not a family, distinctly not a family. It's not a workplace. It's not an entertainment. It's not a club. But what is it? So there are different kinds of relations that fit different purposes. And one that is educational is not really clear how is it distinct from others. I mean, I have some hypothesis, but we really don't know. We didn't really study it well enough. Um, and um, I also want to say that not everything is wonderful about relationality. A lot of abuse that happens in education and around education, a lot of child abuse, um, a lot of sort of cult-like um, or, or, or sector-like uh, very ill communities come from over expanding on education, on, on relationship without understanding the nature of it. You know, that's why uh, if this is a secular society mostly, not maybe this school, but in the secular world, there is no really good way to talk about ideals and ideal relationships. So, yeah, I mean, if you, you know, the, the education is very troubled that way. A lot of people who have, I mean, a lot of people who have the skills to build relationships use them for the wrong thing. So it's a dangerous, actually, game to play. Anything strong like relationality can also be dangerous. So we really have to think more about that. And uh, we, we'll probably have some time for question and answers, but I want to say that I am, I'm here also as a representative. There is an international network. It's called Relation-Centered Education Network, RSEN. Um, so we have a conference every year. I think it's going to be fourth one this spring. Um, they were online before, and now it's going to be both online and in London. The University of East London is hosting it. If you want to, anybody wants to submit a proposal, here's the, here's the link here. Um, and that is, I guess, my final appeal is let's join others that think um, in a similar way. All right. Thank you. So um, this is time for questions. So we have, uh, I think we have, you have time for questions. So please, I, I can uh, pass the microphone to anyone who wants to ask Professor Sasha Sidorkin. Yeah. Well. Thank you very much for your very inspiring paper. And the, the relations are definitely very important during, uh, okay, during our life and during the education, absolutely, uh, no doubt. But uh, what do you think about the pre-educational period when people are just thinking what they will probably learn or what they have at school. And I think there is one very, very important thing. It has to be interesting. I mean, the, the concept of interest, interesting, mm. is absolutely crucial. And uh, I, I just uh, uh, remembered the uh, quotation from the book of Mark Bloch about uh, the book uh, named For What is History? And he told that, you know, how to explain to the, students, to the pupils for what they, uh, they learn history. And he answered, at least it's interesting. And this is the point. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Lubov Kisilov. I'm from the University of Tartu. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's a, that's a great question. One of the central issues of, central kind of challenges of education is motivation. Like, how do you explain kids, well, you learn it. Well, you need to kind of have to go back to what motivation is uh, and what, is, what does it mean to be interested in something. Uh, nobody is born, came to the world with interest in history. 
Right, so, and uh, gaining an interest is a function of some relation that you enter. You like history because somebody else you like, like history. More or less it's the same, even though that relational partner may not be a real human being, it could be a book that you read or, you know, a role model or fictional character. Um, the learning in general is very social. We have actually massive theory now to explain how it is. Uh, not just Vygotsky, but also Bandura and others kind of showed it. To learn, you, you need some other people to learn with. Although you can learn individual as well, but very simple things. Anything more complicated than hot stove or how to find food, you actually have others. So yeah, um, we don't really have a good developmental theory of relationality. Like for example, there is this very basic question, which is the primary relation in human life? And that's why we disagree with Buber and with Bakhtin, because they think dialogue is primary relation. Those are two guys, they know nothing. Um, the actually infant-mother relationship is the primary one to which everything goes down to, right? So, and then what happens is the mother, uh, and it's, it's, it's in our biology, that's the only thing we all share as human being, there was a mother or mother figure that you had when you were young. Otherwise, you wouldn't be alive. Right, so that primary relation then splits, it separates into other ones. And there's actually very good evidence that if you have very troubled infant-mother relationship, you will have problems with that. Uh, there was a Romanian orphanage study that kind of showed that. You know, all of this uh, savage children that grew up with animals, so that they're damaging the relational kind of tissue that binds them to the world. And by the way, um, Instinctively, I think, in Christianity, people understood that because one of the most important icons is the Theotokos, the mother of God with the infant Jesus, right? What is it? It's another icon of the primary relationship. Anything else stems from that, right? But then also, how do you split? Like when you go to school, so you came to preschool and you find, oh, this is like a mother-like figure, but relationships work differently you actually have to do something for them to be loved. And on and on and on. And so I think if you enter adolescent years, there are different kind of relationality with peers that come in, and then the adult's role is not so clear and all of that. So, but anyway, we don't have that kind of uh, developmental chain or like phases of development of human relations. But we, we can say with uh, certainty that people who are successful as adults they carry that relational experience and they know how to build new relationships. They may not know quadratic equations. Yeah, I forgot them too. But they know how to kind of enter into that dialogue with others. They're not stuck to the previous patterns of relation, they can expand on them. So, and that's what education is, is expanding your, your repertoire of relational tools. So the interest is actually one of the tools you build relationship with people with, right? Because you're interested in the same thing. So once you start bringing the third element into the relationality in the relation, that's one of the tools to actually build relations. So again, not relationship for history, history for relationships. So. Thank you. So Sorry we have question. time for one question. Um, Well, uh, in that case, I can ask myself, uh, I, um, I, I wonder about PISA. Does uh, PISA uh, tell us anything about relations? Yeah. <laughs> it actually does, because PISA is not only a test, there is also a questionnaire that they do, and they change it every year a little bit. There is actually a set of questions there about classroom experiences. Um, nobody studied that from that point of view, so if anybody wants to do a doctoral dissertation, PISA have a massive set of data. They'll probably share it with you. It would be interesting to tease out. But then the problem with all this research is you find something. And, with, and all, the first thing we ask is, is it correlated with learning outcomes? Mm. That's a wrong question to ask, right? It's like, you know, those people who argue that, oh, you should study music because it will make you better at math. Well, I'm sorry, you just defeated yourself. You should study music because music is beautiful, not because it makes you better at math. First of all, it's a lie. 
It does make you better at math. And second, you just admitted the subjugated status of your profession by doing that. It's the same thing here. If you find it piece that there are some schools that are relationally much stronger than others, you don't have to prove it with their higher scores on science, because that would be a self-defeating move. No, you need to study its own phenomenon. Kind of, those dimensions are not parallel. They're kind of perpendicular to each other. I can imagine a school that is very good at learning outcomes, but terrible at relationality. Some of the elite schools, it's like more of a drill and kill. You don't really like anyone, but you're just there to, to get through. I don't want my kids in the school like that. So, so don't, you can measure things, but you have to measure by their own scale, not by some other scales. Thank you so much. And uh, so let's thank our first speaker. <laughs>